Hello everybody. In this video, I'm going to be breaking down the most common story structure in a way that you might not have seen before. This specific approach, which I'm going to be sharing with you today, has been used in Hollywood going all the way back to the silent film era. This structure is also present currently in books like The Hunger Games, Red Queen, as well as in books like Dark Matter and Layla. This basic story structure is the three-act structure, but today we're going to be looking at it through the lens of the eight-sequence story structure. The issue with the three-act structure for most people is the middle. Act two, it's simply very large and takes a lot to fill out completely. It spans approximately half of your story and most structures don't quite give you the tools to fill it out appropriately. That's one of the benefits of using the eight sequence story structure. It allows you to divide the whole story up into manageable chunks so that way you can attack the manuscript with ease. So what I'm going to be doing today is showing you how to use that. In addition, I'm going to be shedding some light on how to solve the major issues of Act 2. This A sequence technique is good for both pantsers and plotters. Pantsers can use it to help shape their manuscript after they draft it, while plotters can use it to actually craft their outline. I will set this video up as a reference guide for you, including chapter breaks in the timeline below. What I recommend is that you watch the video all the way through the first time, then come back later to the parts that are relevant to you. As always, I'll include some bonus tips at the end of the video for my people who are really serious. On this channel, we talk about all things writing and screenwriting. If that's something that interests you, make sure you like and subscribe to this video. And make sure you also turn the notification bell on so that way you're hit up every time I post a new video. As a thank you, here's a picture of a cute puppy. And a brief note on structure and creativity. You can share this thought experiment with people who think that outlining or plotting hurts the creative process. I think it's kind of a good analogy to bring up for those kind of conversations. Imagine for a moment you're designing a house. Now I want you to get as creative as possible with designing this house. Go absolutely bonkers with it. Now you obviously need some tools to get the job done, but these tools are not the thing that I want you to focus on. What I want you to focus on is, does your house have rooms? Does it have walls? Does it have a roof or a lack of a roof? It likely has at least one door and perhaps some steps or halls. Even omitting any of these basic things would be a conscious choice. These basic items that you will include in your house regardless of how creative you design it, these basic items are your structure. So the tools are your words, the outline is your blueprint, and the building itself is the structure. Yes, you need tools to build the house, but you don't necessarily need the blueprint of the structure. It just helps you to build it more efficiently. But whether or not you use that blueprint, you will have rooms, at least one. And you will have walls, at least some. And you will likely have at least one entrance. The basic structure of the house exists whether you like it or not. It's embedded in the form. Okay, so in order to break down the eight sequence story structure, we're going to need to recap the three act structure. So here's the three act structure in about 30 seconds. The three act structure is a universal plot structure that in my opinion can be summed up best with three words, beginning, middle, end. This is why the structure works. As humans, we naturally relay information that has a start, a middle, and a conclusion. The transitions between each of the three acts, as well as the center of each of the three acts, generally equates to the most important parts of the story. These important moments are the inciting incident, the end of act one, the midpoint, the end of act two, and the climax. Knowing this basic structure will allow us to attack the eight sequence story structure more effectively. Each of the eight sequences have their own beginning, middle, and end. The end of each sequence will be a major plot point and thus it can be considered the climax of that particular sequence. So 
in the end you're gonna have eight climaxes they just have different names for example the midpoint the biggest thing to keep in mind is that you want your scenes to follow a cause and effect model another way to look at it is to have an event followed by the aftermath followed by another event and so on but more on that later in this video there will be some spoilers for guardians of the galaxy the truman show and love and basketball so if you haven't seen those yet this is your warning I won't be going too into depth on them, but I will be using these films as some of my examples. And I'm going to be using films instead of books because we all have a visual representation that's given to us via film, whereas we all have a slightly different interpretation of what a book might look like. It's just an easier way for us to communicate the ideas. To map the eight sequence technique, you'll need to start with a map of the three act structure and divide it into portions like this. Here I've shown the divisions of the eight sequences and feel free to screenshot or screen capture this. I definitely wanna share any information that I have so that I can make it easier for you on your writing journey. As I mentioned earlier, this technique has been used in Hollywood for over a hundred years. And the reason that they use the eight sequence story structure is very interesting. It actually was because the reels could only hold about 13 to 15 minutes a piece. And it would take about eight reels to make a full feature film. So they had to have the stories somewhat self-contained and then they can do transitions. And if you've ever seen the cigarette burns in the corner of screens in the old movies, that's kind of a signal for them to change the reels. So it does take eight reels back in a day to complete a, a feature film. And that's why you have stories now told still in the eight sequence story structure. Some sequence explanations will be more dense than others because they have more that's required in them. For instance, sequence number one. Sequence number one is from the beginning through the inciting incident. That means that the inciting incident will be the climax of sequence one. Within sequence one, we will also have a beginning and a middle leading up to that inciting incident. If you like, you can think of it as a mini three act structure within the sequence one itself. This pattern is gonna repeat throughout all eight sequences for the rest of the structure. In sequence one, you'll wanna focus on the main character and their world. You want to show us any special skills they have, and they should have at least one. This is where you could put that save the cat moment if you like. A save the cat moment generally is when the main character goes out of their way to help another person or an animal. As a result of this, we kind of get to understand that they are somewhat of a good person and thus someone to root for. The biggest thing that I like to keep in mind is that stories work really effectively when we use this sequence to build a character that can be pitiable. That doesn't mean that the character can't be strong. They can be strong, but it works really well if you have reasons to pity them. This is why so many stories have characters who are orphans. This concept goes all the way back to before Aristotle. You also want to show us their desires and their wants, and you definitely want to give us a hint of the wound. And we should witness how they see their world. This includes the wound and their misbelief. Okay, so the key words of the wound and misbelief. These are something that writers and teachers say that can kind of sound ethereal or kind of heady, but I'm going to give you a simple way to look at it. Just think of it as a trauma or a struggle that happened to the character that affected how they navigate the world. An example could be someone being broken up with in a public manner and their former romantic interest airs out all their dirty laundry, all their secrets. Now, the main character doesn't think opening up to love is a good idea. That is a misbelief and a public humiliation that they incurred well, that's their wound. The wound creates the misbelief. No one just decides to start believing negative things. Things happen to them and those things are their wounds. In Guardians of the Galaxy, 
Peter Quill's wound is depicted when his mother is on her deathbed and all his family's there. He can't bring himself to take her hand in her final moments and in fact he runs out on his family. As a result, he's kidnapped. So the wound is seeing the death of his mother and the misbelief that he eventually gathers from that is that it's probably best to not let people get too close to you because having loved ones makes you weak. That's the opening scene of Guardians of the Galaxy. In the following scenes, we see Star-Lord's special abilities of using his wit to get things done, as well as technology, and we also see his love for music. Eventually, he will use these special skills to partially overcome the wound in the end. However, this won't be enough to defeat the bad guy. It is only by literally taking the hand of his new chosen family that he will be strong enough to defeat the villain. They literally beat the bad guy by just holding hands. They beat him with the power of friendship. Most characters have several misbeliefs and several wounds, but your story should focus on the character overcoming one particular misbelief in order to attain their goal at the end. Again, they won't be able to attain their goal until they overcome that misbelief. If a character makes it to the end and doesn't overcome their misbelief, then that is considered a tragedy. Now, it can be very confusing. A lot of people tend to think that if a character, a main character dies at the end, that that's a tragedy. But that's not necessarily a tragedy. For instance, in the book, they both die in the end, and that's not a spoiler, that's the actual name of the book. These characters overcome their wounds and their misbeliefs before their time is up. So that doesn't make it a tragedy. Sequence two continues through the end of act one. The main purpose here is to solidly present the question that we want answered by the end of act two. It needs to be a yes or no question. The answer needs to be yes or no. <laughs> At the very end of the movie, the answer can be ambiguous. However, the viewer or the reader needs to be seeking a yes or no and they need to be given that at the end of Act 2. Is Neo the one? In romance novels, will the romantic interests get together? Most of the time, there's going to be a breakup at the end of Act 2. So that answers our question, or so we think. Not knowing or being clear with your main story question is the biggest thing that interferes with having a good act two. Once this question is presented at the end of act one, the character, the main character, will go on a literal and or figurative journey to seek out the answer. They often go on to a new world at the end of act one, but almost always they actually walk through a literal door at the end of act one. So be on the lookout for that the next time you watch a movie. Them walking through this door is the beginning of act two. The question of the Truman Show is will Truman escape the show? The question of Guardians of the Galaxy is will the Guardians be able to sail the orb? The question in Love and Basketball is will Quincy and Monica end up together? Again, this is commonly the question of act two in romance pieces. But the hook will be the lens that you tell that story through. For instance, in Love and Basketball, they're using basketball as the vehicle to show the love set pieces. This ends up being their glue, but also ends up being their hurdles because they are so competitive. Other examples of the hook being the hurdle that keeps romantic interests apart are in Verity, Verity by Colleen Hoover. Verity herself is the hurdle for the love interest. In the notebook, Alzheimer's is a hurdle for the more current storyline, while socioeconomic differences are hurdles for the past storyline. So keep in mind then that in many romances, we're not simply asking if they'll end up together. We're also asking how would they overcome this insane hurdle to end up being together. From here, we simply divide act two and a half after the midpoint. Then we have Act 2A and Acts 2B. We're gonna split those down the center as well, right after what can be known as the first pinch point and the second pinch point, respectively. 
And to be clear, that means that for the third sequence, the first pinch point is its climax, while the midpoint is the climax of sequence number four. For sequence five, we have the second pinch point being its climax, while in sequence six, the end of act two is its particular climax. Now, if you're wondering what pitch points are, they tend to be a brush with a force of antagonism. They don't have to be actually fighting the main bad guy. They could be fighting a henchman or something that the bad guy employs. For instance, in the Truman Show, at the first pinch point, Truman actually tries to fly to Fiji. He fails at this. He immediately tries to get a bus ticket to leave for Chicago. This also fails. Here, Truman is getting just a little taste of how powerful the forces are that want him to stay put. In the second pinch point for love in basketball, Quincy has just had a falling out with his father and now he has decided he's going to leave college early to go to the NBA. Instead of confiding in Monica, who is the main love interest, he starts new relations and Monica finds out and this starts to drive a wedge between the two of them. I like to think of the pinch points as many flexes of struggle. It may not be the main breakup or the main battle, but it tends to be the big events that lead up to that. And next we have sequence four, the climax of it being the midpoint. This should be a very high point or a very low point in your story. It works best when new information is revealed here. In Guardians of the Galaxy, they are actually told at the midpoint that the orb they're trying to sell is an all-powerful infinity stone. And as it being a low point here, they actually lose the stone. In the Truman Show, he is sat down by his best friend and confidant and told that if it actually is a show, that even his best friend is in on it, meaning that he can't trust anyone. In Love and Basketball, Quincy receives photographic evidence that proves that his dad cheated on his mom. Sequence five deals with the aftermath of the midpoint initially, and that leads us all the way up to another brush with antagonism at the second pinch point. I briefly went over this when I talked about pinch points, so I'll move on now to sequence number six. In sequence number six, the biggest event should be the end of act two. This is often the lowest point in the story. Sometimes it's the second lowest point in the story. In tragedies, this is often a high point actually. And as I said about romances before, the end of act two tends to be a breakup. Sometimes it could just be someone moving away. If you ever seen a movie where a person went to the airport to chase after their love interest, well, that love interest probably went to the airport right around the end of Act 2. In other genres, this tends to be a defeat of some sort, and it could even be the death of a main character. For instance, in the Guardians of the Galaxy, the bad guys are just beasting everybody, and Groot ends up sacrificing himself for his new family. And as he goes out, the last thing he tells them is that we are Groot. I personally think that this movie could have been nominated for Best Picture for how it visualizes all of the internal struggles with each of the main characters. That leads us to the seventh sequence, which is the first half of Act 3 through the climax. The climax being the final battle. This is where Monica and Quincy play one-on-one -on -one for his heart. This is where Truman rages against the storm and tries to escape. This is the dance-off in Guardians of the Galaxy followed by the Guardians uniting together against Ronan. In all three of those examples, we get very strong examples of a symbolic death and resurrection. Very often there will be a sandwich of reversals here. What you might see is something like the protagonist doing very well using skills they've acquired or skills they already had to seemingly beat the antagonist. But the antagonist is going to have a resurgence and then the protagonist will only be able to defeat the antagonist 
by committing to that change arc that we set way back in act one by overcoming that wound and misbelief then the protagonist will become powerful enough to defeat the villain in guardians of the galaxy we see peter truly commit to reaching out for his loved ones when he takes gamora's hand they even flash back in this moment to when he couldn't take his mother's hand it's kind of like a figurative moment where he gets to go back and heal that wound in the truman show we see him overcome his fear as he conquers that storm when he leaves the sound stage in love and basketball quincy actually beats monica when they play one-on-one for his heart but at the end he says famously double or nothing proving that he ends up choosing her the eighth sequence is the one that may feel optional because it is the denouement it's going to be a return to the new norm and we're going to see how the characters live their life after the events of the story you're going to see all the loose ends kind of tied up here and you're going to see any cliffhangers or hints of danger that you might want to include if you're writing a potential series or you just want to leave your story kind of open-ended a lot of people say they don't like those kind of endings but it does bring readers back if you kind of hint at future danger to come okay so here are those bonus tips that i promised you the beginning of each sequence starting with sequence number two should deal with the aftermath of the previous major plot point including a plan to move forward for instance in sequence number five in the very beginning of sequence number five we should deal with the fallout of the midpoint and make plans and adjustments for what the character should do going forward. In Guardians of the Galaxy, after they lose the stone at the midpoint, we see them negotiating with Yondu about what they're going to do to get the stone back. This is an important tip because what it means is that a large portion of your script, of your book, of your structure is already decided for you because you have obligatory scenes. What I mean by that is you have scenes that you are obligated to write if those major plot points were important to your character. If what happened at the midpoint was important to your protagonist, well, you have to show how it affected them immediately after that. You should not skip that scene because if you skip those scenes, then you're taking out the emotional arc of your story. Also, including those scenes are one of the main ways to help you fill out Act 2. Another tip is using the B story to help you fill out Act 2. You definitely want to hit every single plot point with your A story. But you can make another storyline, your B story, fall within the gaps of each major point for your A story. This technique of having an A story scene or set of scenes followed by a B story set of scenes. This is called a weave and it's how television writers tell multiple storylines in a single episode. If you use the eight sequence story structure to do your A story, you're gonna wanna use a B story that's structured in the same way. Now, you need to keep in mind that the B story should collapse if the A story is gone. What I mean by that is that the B story relies on information from your A story and relies on the characters and the relationships and the stakes from your A story. A good example of this is the storyline of Gamora and Peter as potential love interests. That storyline only exists because the Guardians are all together trying to sell the orb. Okay, tip number three, it makes it very simple if you use labels for your sequences. And I don't mean, for instance, labeling sequence for the midpoint sequence, but instead labeling it by what happens. You can deal with how that actually looks later. An example could be saying, Quincy finds out his dad actually cheated. How it looks for him to find out, whether that be pictures or uh, eyewitness telling him, those are details you can figure out after you finish your whole outline or finish the whole structure of the story. But 
if you write Quincy finds out his dad actually cheated, it allows you to move forward and you know exactly what's supposed to happen at that point in the story. The best part about doing it like this is that you can figure out these major plot points in less than five minutes. I actually show you how to do that in my seven sentence story structure video. I'll have it linked in the description box below. And that brings me to my next tip, which is you wanna make the set pieces genre specific. So for instance, if Quincy finds out that his dad was actually cheating at the midpoint, if you have a ghost tell him this, well, that's not the exact genre for what love and basketball is. Or let's say uh, Quincy's dad cheated and he had a son. That son became a time traveler and he came back and told Quincy that his dad cheated. That's not the same genre as love and basketball but it is the same information happening. So another example of this would be how the Guardians of the Galaxy met each other in that intergalactic prison. If you think about it, they could have just met each other in like a trauma support group or something else. They didn't have to meet each other in an intergalactic prison and have a whole prison escape, but that fits perfectly for the genre and it allows you to see all of their special skills. If you're writing a romance and you have a breakup scene at prom versus a luxury cruise liner that happens to be sinking, well, that's going to be two different genres. Maybe the breakup scene is on a space station or maybe the breakup scene is at some type of dining hall in a vampire academy. I'm trying to give you an example to see that all of these are still breakup scenes and they're only different because you applied a genre filter. If you have any questions on what I've said so far in the video, leave it in the comments below. I either directly respond to you or make a video if I think that it could help a lot more people. Knowing story structure is a great start, but it's not quite enough. To fully attack the manuscript, you're going to need to know how to prepare. I'm gonna give you the strategies on that in the video that's on screen now.